right, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, as Lindsay said, my name is Brian Hughes, and I'm a front-end developer at Ardeo, a music streaming company in San Francisco. I'm also the lead organizer for a meetup group in San Francisco. I'm a member of two Node.js working groups, a somewhat regular speaker at conferences, and a contributor to a popular open source project. So uh, yeah, you could say that I'm pretty involved these days. And today, I'm going to talk about how to get involved yourself. You know, most developers tend to go to work and come home each day, and that's the extent of their involvement in tech. And you know, this is perfectly OK, too. I was one of these developers for the first three years of my career. There's a lot more out there, though. There are conferences such as this one. There's meetups, open source projects, blogging, and more. You know, as Kate Huston talked about on Friday, getting involved in a developer community outside of work can be highly rewarding and you know, sometimes even necessary. But it also entails risks, especially for people from underrepresented groups. So I want to tell my story of how I got involved in the Node.js and Nobus communities and the lessons that I've learned along the way. My journey started one summer at a resort in Florida in the United States. <laughs> I was at JSConf 2013 at the recommendation of a friend, and you know, I was forever changed. It was there that I first learned about Nodebots, and I was hooked immediately. I mean, of course I was hooked. You know, why not? It's JavaScript and robots. What's not to love about that? But more importantly, though, this is where I first met Raquel Velez, AKA Rockbot, employee number one at NPM, and a truly amazing person. You know, I wouldn't be organizing today or involved in robotics if it wasn't for her. It was also because of JSConf that I was first inspired to speak at a conference myself. You know, soon after the conference, one of the speakers there wrote a blog post titled, You Should Speak at JSConf. You know, still coming off the high of the conference, I thought, well, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe I could do this too. So full of excitement and energy, I submitted a talk proposal for JSConf 2014, and it was rejected. Probably with a fiery burning passion, because my proposal was pretty terrible. And you know, that's OK. We always suck the first time we try to do something new. You know, no one rides a bike perfectly the first time, so why should public speaking be any different? Uh, it takes time and practice, but like riding a bike, it's also a lot of fun. It helps if you have someone teaching you how to ride, though. After JSConf, I followed Raquel Velez on Twitter, and I soon found out about Nodebots SF, a JavaScript meetup group in San Francisco. I attended my first meetup in November of 2013, and it was incredible. I built some really fun Nodebots and met many more awesome people there. So by then, you know, my course was set. I had a new favorite meetup, and I had found my community. I didn't let my first talk rejection get to me too much. You know, I realized that my first proposal was terrible, so I scrapped the entire idea and came up with a new one. I'd been working with the Raspberry Pi a lot, and I figured that other people might want to hear about it too. So I wrote a new proposal for Cascadia JS 2014, and it was also pretty bad. You know, it was an improvement over my previous proposal, sure, but it certainly still wasn't good, and so it was rejected too. Now, in this proposal, which was public, I made a mention of Johnny5, a JavaScript robotics library. This attracted the attention of the project's creator and lead. As part of our back and forth online, he mentioned that we should get Raspberry Pi support into Johnny5. I had actually never worked on an open source project that wasn't job related before. Like, you know, the thought hadn't even crossed my mind, to be honest, but you know, now I was intrigued. I wrote up a quick plugin for Johnny5 that added Raspberry Pi support and submitted a pull request. Now, this pro, uh, pull request was also kind of terrible. It was slow. It was missing support for pretty much everything. It had no unit tests or any documentation. And you know, this is also OK, because the first versions of new software are usually really incomplete. You know, they get better over time. I have since rewritten the entire library, and I've given it a lot of love. And it's actually pretty good now. It implements all the features it needs to. It's pretty optimized and has really good documentation to it. But you know, there's still a lot I want to do with it, uh, not the least of which is implementing unit tests that are still missing to this day. You know, getting involved is an ongoing process. It's OK when you don't get everything right the first time. There's plenty of time for that later. And you know, I'm so very glad that I wrote this plugin. You know, knowing that other people are using my software to create amazing art is immensely gratifying. I also learned that you never know where opportunity is going to come from, so always be open to new experiences. I still wasn't deterred from speaking after my Cascadia JS rejection, but I think I may have set my sights a little too high for a first talk, so I decided to try something a bit smaller. In the middle of 2014, some friends I knew from previous work decided to start a new conference called Forward JS. 
I had been playing around with ECMAScript 6 and decided to submit a proposal for a short 15-minute talk on some odds and ends in the spec. This proposal actually wasn't terrible. In fact, it was kind of decent. You know, I submitted this proposal, and this time it was accepted. So it was the first time I had given it a talk at a conference, and it went pretty well. You know, it wasn't great, but pretty well. At the time, I was really worried that someone would ask me some questions about ES6 that I didn't know the answer to, because at the time, there was actually quite a bit about ES6 that I didn't know. You know my fears were completely unfounded, though. There was one question I couldn't answer, and even that wasn't a big deal. You know, I have since learned that you don't have to be an expert on a topic to speak about that topic. And conference organizers want you to talk, and they want to help you be awesome. When you see someone speaking at a conference, or organizing an event, or leading a popular open source project, it's easy to think that they are naturally gifted, that they were somehow born for it. We tend to put experts on a pedestal. We subconsciously think that they are experts in everything just because they're pretty knowledgeable about this one thing. What you often don't see is how much we actually don't know, how much we have failed along the way, and all the other people who helped get us on this stage. You know, those of us speaking here at JSConf.eu, we have failed a lot. We weren't born for it. We don't really know what we're doing, and you know, we're not experts, at least not in the sense that most people assume we are. We're just regular people who decided to take a risk one day. Around the same time I submitted my Forward.js proposal, I was at an all-day Nodebots SF hack event. I was helping to clean up afterwards, and Raquel Velez casually mentioned to me that maybe I should help organize the meetup. I hadn't even given organizing a second thought at this point, because you know, surely organizers have tons of experience, and they've been organizing forever, and how could I possibly help organize because I'm so new, and I would just screw it up, and oh, they wouldn't want me anyways, and, well, round and round my head went. Raquel Velez made me think otherwise, so I reached out to her and Dan Shaw, the other lead organizer. As it turns out, the timing couldn't have been better. The current organizers were working on some awesome new things, and they didn't have as much time to devote to Nobots SF as they once did. And you know, this is when I got to know Dan Shaw better, and he's been so very helpful. You know, I knew nothing about organizing going in, and I'm definitely still learning. And that's okay. We all start at nothing but we don't have to do it alone. There are other people willing to help you if you are willing to take the risk and try it. You know, Dan Shaw, along with a few others, were the ones that helped me. We don't become speakers or organizers or project leaders because we are innately more talented than other people. We're not. We get involved because other people came before us and they were supportive enough and generous enough and welcoming enough to give us a chance and help us succeed. And you know, it's our responsibility to pay it forward, too. So one day earlier this year, I was hanging out in the Johnny Five chat room, and someone dropped a link to a Node.js issue recommending that we start a Node.js hardware working group. At this point, my other experiences so far had taught me to jump on opportunities presented to me, even when I don't think I'm qualified. So I thought, sure, what the hell? Now I'm actually sort of the de facto lead for the Node.js hardware working group, and I represented the group at the most recent Node.js Collaborator Summit. I'm still not sure how that happened exactly, and I'm definitely still figuring out how to lead an online group, but you know, things are happening. Uh, then NodeConf US Adventure happened, where there were a number of discussions about the lack of diversity in the Node.js community, and the Node.js collaborators in particular. Born out of these discussions was the Node.js diversity working group, which I am also a member of. Now, this group is still very new, and we're still figuring out what our mission is exactly there are going to be some very tough challenges for this group to solve as well. You know, I'm excited, but also kind of nervous to see where it goes. I hope I'm able to bring some value to this working group, although I constantly question my abilities at being able to do so. You know, at one point, I actually even thought about quitting the group altogether because the challenges seemed insurmountable. Then someone I have never met before commented on a PR I had open, you know, someone who was affected by the lack of diversity in the Node.js collaborators. Their comments and kind words gave me a determination that I lacked until then. You know, I might have quit without them. You know, people don't just help us get into a community. They are the reason that we stay. When I think through everything that's important in my life, you know, in the end, it's all about people. You know, that's what motivates me, people. And I think that that's what motivates most everyone else, too. You know, looking back across the years, I realize that I am prone to small bouts with imposter syndrome. 
Geek feminism describes imposter syndrome better than I could, so I'm simply going to read their definition to you. Imposter syndrome is a situation where someone feels like an imposter or fraud because they think that their accomplishments are nowhere near as good as those of the people around them. Usually, their accomplishments are just as good, and the person is applying an unfairly high standard to themselves and not to others. You know, I think this is something we're all prone to. It's human nature. But it's important that we recognize it for what it is, though, a trick that our minds play on us. You know, I sincerely believe that every single one of you in the audience is capable of speaking at a conference or contributing to an open source project or writing blog posts or organizing events. We aren't going to be great at all of these things. You know, very few people are, but everyone has talent at something. I realize that the, talk of this, or the title of this talk is The Risks and Rewards of Getting Involved and How to Do It. And yet, I haven't really talked about the risks or how to do it, have I? So let me address the how to do it part first. If I haven't made it obvious already, getting involved isn't as hard as most people think. You know, it's not some gauntlet that we put you through, nor do we only accept the best of the best of the best of the best. You know, if you are willing to put yourself out there to take a risk, then we'll help you on your journey. When you feel motivated to do something, commit to that motivation, and then reach out to others already doing it. And uh, you know, that's it. That's the secret to getting involved. Commit to doing it, and then ask for help. When you feel motivated, or when, the thing is, though, this process is easier for some people than it is for others. Exclusion, marginalization, and an existing lack of diversity are very real problems that conspire to keep underrepresented people out of our developer communities. So I'm going to switch gears for the remainder of our time together, and we're going to talk about this. I'm going to start, as I have everything else, with a story. So I grew up in a conservative part of Texas in the United States. I'm also a liberal, bisexual atheist, among many other things. As you can imagine, I did not belong in Texas, and San Francisco seemed like a paradise. The texting was far from the only reason that I moved there. I genuinely believed that San Francisco was more enlightened when I moved there in 2009. I thought that companies were more diverse and welcoming, and that they valued different points of view, and all well, that Silicon Valley wasn't the cesspool of misogynistic, racist, ableist, homophobic, xenophobic assholes that it is. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like I was enlightened back then either. As a cis white, a soon-to-be straight male, I didn't directly encounter or see these problems. You know, sure, I still encountered anti-gay bigotry, but well, I was more or less used to it. I also wasn't out back then, so there's that too. I didn't view myself as part of the problem. I mean, I never hit on women at professional events, or men for that matter. I never said anything overtly misogynistic online. I didn't engage in overtly harassing behavior. You know, surely I was one of the good guys, right? Well, no, I wasn't. I was contributing to the problem in my own way. I see that now. Back then, I had no idea what microaggressions were. I didn't know what intersectionality was. I didn't understand that staying silent meant condoning the status quo, and that the status quo is pretty terrible. Here's the truth of the matter. The tech industry card deck is stacked. If you didn't win the lottery of being a young, affluent, educated, straight, cisgendered, able, American white male, you are automatically at a disadvantage. When it comes to people, our industry is fundamentally broken, and we are all complicit. Because not standing against the current status quo is to support it. Not standing with those facing harassment and abuse is to condone harassment and abuse. You know, not uh, sitting comfortably in your own situation Ignoring those around you who are suffering is to say, fuck you, I got mine. If you aren't contributing to make our, our industry better, you are contributing to making it worse. And me, I was part of the problem. I was contributing to making it worse. I still am to some extent, but you know, now I'm trying to be part of the solution too. So what changed? I started listening. I started believing women, people of color, LGBT, the disabled, when they say there's a problem. And to be clear, I'm not an expert on this stuff, not even close, and I don't think I ever can be. And I still screw up. And that's okay, too. 
As long as I catch myself or have someone call me out on it, I apologize for it properly and promptly, and I take steps to ensure I don't do it again. These last parts are critical, though. You know, making mistakes is okay. We're only human, and we're going to make mistakes. But not learning from those mistakes and repeating them over and over and over again, you know, that is real harm. So, a few years ago, I was really unhappy at a previous job. At the time, it was difficult for me to put my finger on exactly why I was unhappy. Later on, I came to realize that it was because this company was well, pretty typical for Silicon Valley, which is to say misogynistic and homophobic, and on and on and on. The culture of this company was basically the antithesis of inclusivity: you know, personal attacks and shouting matches, and pull requests and meetings, gendered, ableist, homophobic slurs used frequently by everyone up and down the power chain. You know, complaining about so-called social justice warriors and the PC police. Stories and rumors of much. Much worse. There was a reason that there were only two women engineers in a team of 60, and that both of them were brought in through acquisitions. The company didn't care about hiring women, and even if they did, there was a hostile work environment waiting for any woman unlucky enough to enter. And you know, as for me, I didn't feel comfortable being myself there, evidenced by the fact that I didn't come out to a single coworker. I was scared to come out. You know, I didn't feel that I would be accepted for who I really was, and that I would face a wave of harassment if I did. So I quit, and it was the single best thing I have ever done for my entire career. Now, I'm not picking on this company because they are noteworthy. I'm picking on them because they are average, and that is a major problem. When I went looking for a new job. My number one requirement was a not terrible culture. Everything else was secondary. I found Ardio, which is made up of some pretty amazing people. You know, we're not perfect, and we still have some work to do to make our culture better and increase diversity. But you know, I'm actually optimistic that we can do it, and I'm comfortable being myself there. So, what does all of this have to do with community? Well, my experiences in life and work taught me something crucially important, and what I learned is this: the reason many people get involved, or stay involved, or leave a community, or quit a job, is directly related to how comfortable they are being themselves. This is true whether it's an employer, or a community, or a circle of friends, or a family. You know, we have to be kind to one another. We have to be all of us, even if you're not an organizer or a regular speaker or regular attendee. Even you know we are all responsible for shaping our community. Organizers play the biggest role, of course. Organizers are the ones who set the initial culture for the community, and they have the power to take disciplinary action when needed. But you know we can't be everywhere at once. We aren't privy to every conversation, every interaction between attendees. You know, to change the tech industry from one where entitled people think it is acceptable to say bigoted, offensive things in our communities, into one where people are recognized and celebrated for their accomplishments and achievements, regardless of sexual orientation, gender, race, or anything else, we need your help. To illustrate why, let me tell you another story. I was at a robotics conference last year, and it was amazing. It had a diverse lineup of speakers, a strong code of conduct, and organizers who genuinely care about the community. You know, despite all this, it didn't go without incident. One of my good friends, one of the most amazing roboticists I know, was there as an invited expert. She was hanging out at her booth with her hardware, and this guy comes up to her and just asks her point blank, "So did your dad build this?" You know, in a single sentence, he managed to dismiss her abilities and make her feel excluded. You know, I was there as an invited expert too, but no one ever said anything like that to me or any of the other invited experts who were men. Whether it was intentional or not, it happened because she was a woman. You know, these kinds of incidents happen all the time too. There have probably been at least a dozen similar incidents here at JSConf EU already. Organizers can't be everywhere at once. We need your help. So, how can you help? Well, the first step is knowing what to look for. We tend to know our own worlds well, what people similar to us are going through. 
The key is being able to cultivate a basic understanding of what people not like us are going through. Now, this takes a concerted effort to learn, and it requires a lot of practice. It's really hard, but it's also really necessary. So start learning about social justice. You know, understand what privilege is and how it manifests itself. Listen to and believe women, people of color, LGBT, the disabled, and others when they speak about harassment and exclusion. When someone calls you out on your inappropriate behavior, apologize properly, think about what you did, and change your behavior. Call out others when they are acting inappropriately, and do it in the moment if it's safe to do so. It may be scary and awkward and make others uncomfortable, but well, that's actually the point. Making people uncomfortable and upset is how we affect change. If you are more involved already, recognize that you have a responsibility to the rest of the community. You know, don't speak or attend conferences that don't have a code of conduct or are known for a hostile environment. You know, make it known publicly why you're not attending there either. For people in positions of power, make sure that you are building a good community. Make inclusivity a central pillar of every last thing that you do. You know, don't just let it be an afterthought. The, how you treat people and the community that you build are the only things that matter in the end. Don't know where to start? The Geek Feminism Wiki and Model View Culture, whose links are here in the slide, are excellent resources, and I encourage all of you to go read them. You know, the Johnny Five community is pretty good as far as communities go. We're not perfect, of course, no one ever is, but there are a lot of wonderful, caring, and empathetic people in our community. And other communities can be like this, too. And not just communities, our workplaces can be better as well. But just like communities, bosses aren't the only ones responsible for creating safe spaces, you know, even if they share the bulk of the burden. You know, we all play a part in making our own workplaces better. When it comes to people, the tech industry is broken. It is the new Wall Street. We suffer from a severe lack of diversity, and diversity is actually getting worse, not better. Lack of diversity hurts business. It hurts productivity. It hurts creativity. An industry of young, affluent, straight, cisgendered, able white men only caters to young, affluent, straight, cisgendered, able white men. It ignores the business opportunities of the majority of the population of this planet. But more fundamental and far more important, though, lack of diversity hurts people. It hurts our brothers and sisters. You know, fuck the business case. This is about people and dignity and respect and making the world a better place. Not just for a few, but for everyone. Our industry doesn't have to be terrible. We can actually be the source of hope and change we so often like to pretend that we are. You know, we can be a part of communities filled with empathy and love and respect for everyone. We can make this happen, but all of us, all of us are needed to make that difference. Thank you.